Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Matan Hazanov. Today we have a very special guest, Michael Durantz. Michael has an incredible career trajectory, going from working at an executive at some of the largest tech companies in the world to joining an early stage business, helping them get to a billion dollar exit, and then joining a startup. And there's quite a lot of incredible learnings in between going from the corporate world to early stage businesses and then becoming a venture capital investor. So we're very excited today to have him. Uh, Michael, thank you for coming. Thank um, you so much for having me. Love to learn. Let's start off with just a background on you. Where, where'd you start off? Where'd you learn? Uh, absolutely. So I, I guess I, I started in, uh, in corporate America. Actually, my very first uh, enterprise job was uh, uh, working for an oil company, which I've often said is a little bit like a satire on business in the IT department. But um, I quickly transitioned on to uh, Nortel. Uh, back when you'd be proud to say that it was a, um, a very uh, interesting and thriving and uh, that was uh, the largest tech company in Canada at one point, right? Yeah, it, it was, and they uh, they were very aggressive, had great products, and um, you know at Nortel you literally didn't have a bad day. And I was lucky enough to to be involved with a team that introduced a uh, a small PBX that you know went from nowhere to the number one PBX in the world. That certainly helped my career. Moved up through the ranks there and ran their. Uh, application business. And uh, it was there that I took my, it was after that, that I took my first, uh, um, I dipped my toes in the, uh, in the startup world and, uh, and uh, joined a company called uh, Savile Systems. Great. Yeah. So why did you leave Nortel? You know, you were an executive there. I think uh, you were a product lead, GM, director, mm -hmm. whatever, whatever they called it back in the day. Yeah. And then you decided to jump, uh, jump ship to go help a uh, startup. Why? <laughs> yeah, well, great question. It's um, I, I think it was really more about you know just being ready for for a change. Um, you know, I enjoyed my time, and in fact, you know, as as we discuss, I think you'll 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 see that I enjoyed my time at at uh, you know at the larger corporations, and I've kind of interleaved startup e experiences. Um, but I think it was it was mostly about the the opportunity that was presented to to me at the time. Um, I was ripe for change. I, I was either going to be going down to Richardson to continue my career, uh, you know, with a promotion at, at Nortel. Uh, but literally just before I'd committed to that, I was approached on this startup. And uh, of course, you're always curious. Uh, and it, it was really the solution. It was a, it was a, actually, it was really more the opportunity than the solution um, because it was a, you know, infrastructure billing software company for telcos and it was at a time where deregulation was happening so it was i could see right away that it was just a tremendous opportunity straightforward emerging demand and they already had a uh, um you know a, a very good product in in the making so uh I, I was i was just very lucky i've been kind of fortunate to have people approach me with opportunities i've just been able to look at a lot of stuff and this one looked fantastic. Right. And Savile eventually sold for like, what, a billion dollars eventually? A couple of years after you joined. Yes. Yeah, it did. So, I mean, that is a success story. I'll, I'll share some more cautionary tales <laughs> with you uh, later. But it, um, uh, the company grew. And uh, I mean, the, the reason for the, it got to about $250 million in revenue, approximately that. And it was thousands of uh of customers and you know it was a had all the hallmarks hallmarks of a of a, a great play like a really good team um strong demand um but i i you know it, it was pretty much raining customers so you had deregulation happening everybody needed that wanted to either m an existing incumbent in the telco space that wanted to move into a new a uh, line of business, for example, they needed new infrastructure software, new billing software to do it. Uh, it sounds pretty boring stuff when you talk about OSS or billing software, but- Boring it, businesses are the best. <laughs> yeah, it, it was fundamental. And so then you had a lot of new entrants coming in, uh, competitive local exchanges. So um, it really was about kind of hanging on by your, your, your fingernails because there was a lot of demand, there was a lot of customers and it was, a, you know, I learned a lot about um, being able to take risks because you you had to open your arms up wide and accept all these customers and assume a lot of risk because sometimes you just didn't have, you know, the complete solution or the infrastructure or the resources in place even to deliver, but you knew you were going to take that customer and figure it out. 
Right. So you joined pretty early on in that that business, right? Yeah. When it was just uh, getting going and it was a pretty unique time, as you said, deregulations in the telecom industry. And that was also the run up in the uh, tech bubble. And this is uh, late 90s, early 2000s, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, pretty amazing time. Uh, like, pretty amazing time in tech. Um, what ended up happening? So the business got acquired. What did you do, what did you do with that business? What was your role? Uh, the role, I had a few different roles. So it evolved. I started off running uh, product management, which was um, uh, a pretty a fundamental part because the business was going from a lot of more customized software and they had a lot of solutions for providers out there, but, um, you know, each one was sort of on a different branch of the, the core software. So the job was to really kind of harness all of the features, get onto a single software stream. And then we were introducing new products on, on new platforms, uh, because, you know, there were, um, uh, uh, certain, you know, platform requirements and preferences that, that the telco world had. So it started out as product management and that was, you know, philosophically very important to the company to get to the point of moving from a lot of custom work to actually delivering true products and, and solutions, um, which of course contributes to, to scale. And then I ran the global consulting business, which was several thousand employees for a while. We acquired a company in uh, Australia. And, uh, and I was sent out there to run that in, in Asia Pacific for the, uh, for the organization. So that was, uh, that was a pretty good gig. Let me tell you. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's, that's great. So got acquired. Then I guess you joined the corporate was it AD, ADC. Yeah, that's right. So ADC telecom, which w was in interesting. So, it was, it, you know, we ended up, um, having a few offers on the company and we were surprised by, surprised by ADC telecom because it was fundamentally more, you know, in the, in the piece parts and, and hardware business as opposed to software. Uh, but they were getting into the software business. So yeah, ADC Telecom acquired us. They were based out of Minneapolis. Uh, I was one of the, had to come with the deal executives. So they, um, you know, rescued me from all that beautiful weather in Australia. <laughs> and I had to move to the corporate head office, which was in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. uh, being a hearty Canadian, that wasn't so bad, I suppose. But Where in uh, Australia, by the way? Uh, it was Brisbane. Okay, that's nice. I, I lived in Sydney for like six months. It was one of the nicest places in the world. It's gorgeous. We had offices there as well, so I, I got there quite a bit, yeah. That's amazing. So before going on to kind of what happened at ADC, what was the biggest lesson you learned at Saville? Like, that's an incredible growth story to go from basically a startup to a billion dollars. almost never happens even today, and this is like 20 years ago. Yeah. What was the biggest lesson you learned? Um. Uh, well, first of all, it was a great team. So there was a lot of ingredients that were there. In fact, that's that's kind of what, you know, I'd, I'd had a lot of offers when I was at Nortel. And it was really just the quality of the play that, you know, was, was put in front of me that that made me a look at it. So I knew it it it, it had a tremendous opportunity, all the hallmarks of, of what you'd be looking for in a startup. Um, I think one of the the biggest lessons that I learned from that uh, was, you know, was around being able to take risk. When you come from an environment like Nortel, and that's for a large enterprise, you know, that's a very go for it kind of company, very aggressive, but still it's a big company. You have certain guardrails on what you can do and what you can't do. A lot of process, some bureaucracy ar around what you're doing, a lot of collaboration. And then you move to an environment in a startup where it's raining customers. Um, you, you have to be able to accept a lot of risk. Mm -hmm. And I think if we, and there were times where you were, you were accepting new contracts and new business from customers, and it was very unclear how we were ever going to be able to deliver because there was so much business. We had only so many resources, and you had to find a way to deliver solutions faster, more efficiently. You had to be able to hire the right kind of people, which was, was pretty challenging at the time. So I think, you know, you know, one of the lessons I learned is the contrast in going from this big company where everything was much more logically and strategically thought out mm -hmm. to this environment where you had to just go, whoa. And like I said, hang on by your, your fingertails. We had a tiger by the tail. You had to open your arms and take on as many customers as you could because it was a land grab and you had to figure it out. So, um, uh, I, I, you know, I'd call that risk taking, which is. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Sounds like it. So then you go back into a corporate environment I assume it was pretty different than Nortel, but you, you tell me, was it a different type of corporate environment? What were the different main differences? Uh, it, w it was, yeah, it was a different environment than, than Nortel for, for sure. Um, 
because you know the software business that we brought to the table was was new to them. So there were certainly some growing pains on the integration. But I also had a different um, gig at the time. Normally, I, I run divisions. I, I run uh, companies, and that's what I'd been doing. Um, and uh, they they brought me in to do the M and A. And they were a very acquisitive organization, so I learned a tremendous lot about that space. And it was it was quite fun going from managing you know hundreds, if not thousands, of of people to suddenly you know it's really yourself and maybe some other people, support mm-hmm. people, and research people. And you just you get to travel the world, the well travel the world, certainly travel the United States, and and look for uh, companies to to buy because we were very search oriented. We didn't just sit and wait for information memorandums to cross our desk. So, so it, it was, it was kind of a different gig that I had there. And one that was actually very, very useful because no matter what you're doing, if you're running a big company, if you're running a small company, you know, the kind of M and a experience acquisitions, mergers, you know, if you have that, that experience in your toolkit, I think you're, you're much better off for it. Definitely. And because you enjoy punishment, you decide to go back into startup land. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this time you joined as a CEO of uh, call genie. Yep. Um, when it had 10 employees, right? Something like that? Yeah, that was, it was a very small startup. It was, you know, 10 to 12 employees. Uh, actually, and there was, although there was Toshiba in between there. Oh, right, so, Toshiba, yeah. So from, I, I kind of had to stay. I had the, the golden handcuffs um, uh, at, at ADC. And then once, once my, my term w- was finished up, I had an offer from Toshiba to run their telecom business. And that went mm-hmm. really well. That was probably one of my, my favorite sort of, uh, corporate uh, gigs because it was a great brand, and um, uh, and if you understood how things worked at Toshiba and how the folks in Tokyo thought, you could you could really do uh, a lot of great things or with a brand like that, and they and you know a lot of access to to money. So uh, so we did really well. We turned around. Are they their, hiring? <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe not so much anymore. They're on hard times That's now, right. but but they. Um, uh, so they had a PBX business because of my experience. What's PBX for people that don't know what uh, that is? Yeah, it's, it's basically a small telephone system. So it's a it's a business telephone system for medium and small offices. Uh-huh. Okay. Um, so you know the phone systems that are used in you know enterprises, they're some form of a PBX. You know, from a small to to a large one, depending on how big the the office is. So it's a communication system now involving much more than just voice and IP, but. Um, so uh, that, that was an interesting gig because I had to take a business that had been declining sort of period over period for, for several years. And, you know, I think was about seventh or eighth part of market share and Toshiba doesn't like that. They want, you know, number one or two. And we turned it around on a dime. It was a great team, um, you know, exploited the, the brand and the reliability um, and, uh, and, you know, got into the number two spot before, um, you know, I, I made the move and I, what did you call it? Punishment back into the uh, <laughs> back into the startup world. Yeah. So you were responsible for the entire telecom division at Toshiba. Yeah, and eventually uh, because that did go well, so I, I was promoted to a group exec. I ended up running six of their 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 business, something they called the Digital Solutions Group. Wow. So like that's a pretty incredible career, you know, up until that point. And there's still a whole other story to you yeah. know, not even like halfway through. And um, why not just? That sounds to me because you also enjoyed it. Why not just stay at that cushy job? I'm sure I'm sure you were well compensated. I'm sure it was great. Like why to me it sounds crazy. I mean, for me it doesn't actually, because I'm an entrepreneur myself. I kind of yeah. but to most people, to a lot of people, it sounds crazy to leave that kind of job to go to a startup. Like what what was why? <laughs> it it was it was it was a tougher decision, but uh some of the same things that influenced me to to go from Nortel to Savile, um, I guess influenced me to lead Toshiba and go go to this. It really was, you know, obviously I'm not a serial entrepreneur, but obviously I have that that tendency because I've gone back and forth. And it really was the the quality of the opportunity. I've always been really lucky. You know, I've been, uh, for whatever reason, people pass a lot of things in front of me. I get to look at a lot of opportunities. And this one was very similar in that, it, you know, it was at the advent of mobile local search and it was... Uh, a solution that was addressing, you know, um, uh, the yellow pages need to move out of, remember print phone books? You know, I used those, to see that. I was still a young kid, but yeah, yeah. I remember seeing the thick. Yeah, me too. Book. I was a young kid. I was a very young executive. I was 11. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that does date me a bit. But they, you know, obviously they had to brace, uh, you know, digitization and um, digital advertising. 
And so, and, and mobile advertising and mobile local search and those kinds of things. So uh, they had a good run there. You know, the, the yellow pages were incredibly profitable growing business and, and they, um, you know, just had monopolies on, on the markets that, that they were in. But that was another one. It was a sea change, which was a lot like Savile, where the deregulation was happening. This was a massive sea change away from, you know, kind of print and traditional forms of advertising and search to, uh, to digital, mobile, local search. And so uh, that appealed to me, that massive seal change, where you could see that, you know, there was an entire industry that had to shift to that because the writing was on the wall, obviously, for uh, the, the print uh, yellow pages books were going to be doorstops pretty soon and, and cease to exist. So that really appealed to me. Um, and I think there was an element, maybe this doesn't make for a good podcast, but we're all people, right? So there was an element that, you know, I'd been outside of Canada uh, for a while and as nice as Australia was, and uh, the U.S. isn't. In fact, the gig with Toshiba was in California, which mm -hmm. is another paradise. Uh, there was a little bit of, you know, just thinking it would be great to, to get back to Canada. And that's where the opportunity was. Really? Canada? <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I'm joking. Um, <laughs> we have seasons. <laughs> so one of the, you brought up a couple of, this point a couple of times, which is very important. I always ask entrepreneurs, especially early stage ones, when we're looking to invest in them or when I'm giving them advice, is you have to answer basically two questions. Why, why you, like, why are you the right person to build this business? But the second one that's just as important is why now, what is changing in the market that allows you to capture some significant value or to create significant value? If you were building a CRM like Salesforce 20 years ago, yeah. that's a good, that's a good answer because, Hey, there, there's this whole thing called the internet and you could do more things, you know, with technology. Um, if you said today I'm building a new CRM like Salesforce, it's like, well, that's been done to death. Right. Yeah. Uh, and both times that you went into a startup, there was, or even at, uh, well, really both times you went into a startup, there was a change in the market deregulation or, you know, digit digitization of marketing, for example, with uh, Yellow Pages. Yeah. That is a very good lesson. It's a very important lesson I think every entrepreneur should recognize. If there isn't a good answer to why now, you have to really look at your assumptions about why you're building this business in the yeah. first place. Yeah, I, I think that's extremely well said. And you'll see if, uh, you know, we'll probably talk a little bit about the venture uh, capital uh, situation in Zy Ventures Fund. But it's, yeah, it's it's one of the tenets of the criteria that that we look for, uh, you know, when it comes to uh, uh, to startups. So, uh, yeah, I couldn't agree more with you. So you joined, um, what was it, uh, Call Genie? Call Genie, yeah. Yeah, who joined Call Genie as their CEO. Yes. And... So what happened? Tell, walk us through, you know. Oh, it, it was, well, this, this is a story that, that has a, an arc to it because we, um, you know, small group of people, very good position, uh, had the, the uh, beginnings, if not the, a lead customer in the Yellow Pages group in, in Canada. And, and again, a, a, a tremendous product market fit in terms of, you know, being a real solution for what the industry needed. Um, so, the first part of the journey felt an awful lot, lot about Savile. There was a, a lot of interest uh, in what we did. We took off like a rocket ship. Um, now, that was because strategically, all of the executives and all of the, you know, the, the, the entire industry knew that they needed to embrace these kinds of technologies. So interestingly enough, selling the technology uh, wasn't such a problem. So that was great. And that was good for the initial period of growth. But some of our business model was also incorporated the usage of the product, for example. And that's where, where some of the challenge was because, you know, as, as you say, you can lead a horse to water, but, you know, trying to make them drink is another thing. Mm -hmm. So all the executive knew that they had to embrace these new technologies, knew they had to develop these different business models as the print business was going to decline, but trying to actually get them to truly embrace it inside the organization once the software was was purchased and implement it properly and and drive it and and build business on these platforms. You know, that's that's another st story because old habits die hard. They didn't have the skill set. They didn't have the understanding of the of, of the new space. So th that was a real challenge getting it implemented and getting it thriving within the organizations and the yellow page groups that, that we sold to. So the first part felt like a rocket ship. Um, there, there was an external factor and maybe this is going to 
be something that emerges as a, as a theme in terms of markets and timing. But um, then we, we, the financial crisis hit. We actually had, shortly before, raised money with some of the best you know, names around, Goldman Sachs Partner Fund out of New York, uh, Front Street in Canada. We'd raised quite a bit of money from them. Yellow Pages Group even made a strategic investment. How much in did us. you raise? Um, in total, oh. probably 40 odd million. I think on the one wow. round with Goldman Sachs, that was uh, around $20 million. And this is uh, 15, 20 years, 15 yeah, years ish, ago? Ish. Yeah. That's that's a lot of even today. First of all, today it's a lot of money, but certainly back then when yeah. this kind of venture capital was still nascent in Canada, it wasn't yeah. a huge industry. Even today, it's not a big industry, but it's ten times bigger than what it was back then. Yeah. That's a huge amount of money. Yeah, it was. Um, I mean, we were we were kind of the darling, and because you know, it again, we we were addressing, I think, a really good opportunity, and like I said, a rocket ship, and we got very good investment. On the other hand, you had to build a lot. Yeah, you, you have to remember this was a fairly early stage startup. So it took a lot of R and D and investment in the product to kind of realize the, the, the value proposition and the offering. So it, it took some money to, to build out, but, um, uh, then the financial markets collapse. So Lehman brothers, I'll never mm-hmm. forget that fateful day where literally Goldman Sachs was grooming us to do a roll up in the U S with other local mo- mobile search and advertising companies and to kind of create, almost use us as a platform company, which was incredibly flattering and daunting, uh, and use some of the money that we had, as well as, you know, even any other investment we needed to acquire companies. Uh, but, um, you know, suddenly everything became risk off, and it became pretty apparent why when uh, Lehman Brothers, you know, uh, collapsed, and the markets did. And so that was certainly a lesson about the importance of, of uh, market timing, because... Oh, yeah. Um, you know, when you're a rocket ship and you're trying to, you know, make your way out of orbit, because that was our trajectory. Now, literally, we, we'd only got to about seven or eight million dollars of, of revenue, maybe a couple hundred employees. But the world was our oyster. We had a tremendous opportunity in front of us. It was we were expecting pretty explosive growth after that uh, organic as well as, you know, new business and, and acquisition. And then suddenly you're out of fuel. So, and everyone knows what happens to a plane that's, you know, that's taking off and, and you run out of fuel. So it very quickly became a matter of, you know, retrenching and survival uh, because it was, a, it was an extremely uh, difficult time. And so literally it, it was, that was a, a massive and almost overnight a change that, that we had to deal with. And, you know, it was important to do that. You had to work quickly, you had to cut costs, you're, you know, and everything up to that point, all your instincts in a growth company is just to build and build and build and um, and acquire your talent and and to continue to go and move and shock and groove and get into new markets. And suddenly it, it came down to survival and having the skill set to, uh, you know, to to retrench and get to a point that, that you can survive. So we had a little bit of money still from some that we'd raised. Then some of that money I talked about we were able to raise after to continue but eventually we ended up, you know, selling for a, a much lower valuation. How do we sold just before that? Um, you know, our, I think our market cap at one point was over $200 million, which is a credible multiple on the revenue that, that we had. Uh, but wow. we ended up selling to a, a company that was uh, doing work in the, with the Yellow Pages in the U.S., but it was, uh, you know, for much less money than, than obviously. Can you share invest- what, what uh, the acquisition price was at the end? Uh, Probably not. Probably, Probably not. prefer not to. <laughs> but it was, <laughs> but it was, it was a two. fraction. I, what I can say, it was certainly a fraction. It, it was a fair deal, but the company moved into survival. And the best thing I can say about that, that whole process was, um, you know, as, as it's not as pleasant as getting a, a, a great exit, but it was, you know, it was all about, you know, surviving and, uh, and keeping the company to the point where, you know, the company could continue and at least, you know, sell for some value to uh, somebody. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and there, be, because it was public company, there was an opportunity to appreciate beyond that. Uh, although that, that company ended up not doing very much with it. So uh, there, there ended up not being the upside. You know, that, that could have been different if that company would have, uh, you, know, you know, realized some of the plans that, that they had. But yeah, it was, it was a fraction of the value that had been originally created. And, you know, uh, so I think if you've, talk about lessons learned you know one of them is you know the importance of of uh is is again around market timing and 
you know, being on stream and, you know, it's just the metaphors, you know, it's like, it's hard to swim when the tide is out. And when you're in the startup world, it's all about capital. That's the lifeblood of, of what you're doing. You, you need capital. Everything takes twice as long and is twice as hard to do. And so if that spigot gets turned off and if it gets turned off pretty quickly, um, you know, that, that's, that's going to be a real challenge. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm proud of the fact that we kind of scrambled and uh, we're able to raise more money and keep going and, uh, and I guess salvage the, the company. That was, that was really it. But, you know, right. ben, this the, is the overall market conditions, you can't ignore them. Their overall mm-hmm. market conditions, you know, the, the macro factors and timing is just such a huge factor in, in, in this game. Right. And this cycle happens all the time. In late 2021, I was advising a startup founder, great industry, great background, everything. They had some interest from VCs. Uh, this person asked me for my advice. They had a term sheet, a good one, close to what they were asking for in valuation. Yeah. And they were being pursued by other VCs. So they had a term sheet that was going to expire. And they said, well, we want to get a better offers because all these other VCs are telling us, hey, we like this so much. Why don't you let us make a counter offer? but they kept delaying diligence mm. and they never got a, a term sheet from, from anybody else. The other term sheet expired. The other VC walked away and we know what happened in late 2021 when interest rates started to go yeah. up and the VC market became cold, you know, by Q1 2022 VCs were starting to withdraw a little bit from yeah. giving these crazy valuations. This company ended up getting no deal yeah. and they eventually failed. Um, so market timing is very important, but aside from market timing, cause that's, it seems like that's an external factor. Mm-hmm. What do you, is there anything you could have done differently as the leader of this business to kind of change the outcome in a more positive way? Um, I, uh, I, I really think it would have been to, um, it, it would have been to have done value creation at, at the time. Like the shift was literally, it couldn't have been more sudden and it couldn't have been more of a contrast from having a, a you know a, a great company like goldman sachs and all the resources behind you and the ability to execute on a plan to suddenly uh you know and it wasn't just goldman sachs the entire market you know had, had dried up and we were you know public at that time so suddenly your evaluation is going down it's a very tough situation because you can talk about geez we're every bit the company that we were before the stock price started to plummet but you're you are what your your stock price is, so it became right. extremely hard to uh, to recover from that and and raise money. But I I, I suppose just um, you know I, I, based on maybe future learnings and looking back in retrospect, um, you know trying to find value creation solutions outside of the existing business. The key to that kind of scenario would be to shake it up. In other words, to try and find other companies, I think, to merge with, to try and find companies that either you can acquire or merge with to kind of change the value proposition, change, um, you know, uh, you know your, your position in the marketplace. Uh, so I think it would have taken something that major. I don't think internally, you know, it was very much about survival and we continue to service and look after customers, but it was, it was a different market. But mm-hmm. if there was one thing that, I, I, go, I guess I'm speculating that that might have uh, changed things with just change that mix, add some other technologies and companies uh, uh, to it and turn it morph into something else. Right. And this is, uh, I see this all the time in terms of startups that raise a lot of money. Um, and once there is a, ch- a change in the market, like, like you mentioned, you know, timing is so, has such an impact on startups that are burning cash continuously. Yeah right? And rely on external capital to continue growing. Once there's a change in the market that makes that growth rate decline, then that company, that startup is usually on a, a death spiral. You know, they need, they keep needing cash to, to run their business, right? External cash and investment, but they're not going to get it if their growth rate isn't crazy high. So what are you going to do at that point? You have to cut expenses, which is going to make it harder to get growth, yeah. not easier. And then that the cycle just continues. Uh, it's one of the one of the cautionary tales of raising too much money. I usually tell founders it's just because you can raise it doesn't mean you should, um, because you want to leave some some dry powder, some some ability to continue raising, not give up all your equity up front. But that's not the exact situation you had, but it's still once you're in that spiral, it's almost impossible to get out. Yeah, it's 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 challenging, but I mean, you know, you've got to realize it and acknowledge. 
uh, you know, I think one of the challenges a lot of entrepreneurs have is they're they're still attached to to their dogma, right? Uh, and uh, and you just got to recognize the environment you're in, and and um, you know, you got to roll with the punches, I guess, as they say, and yeah, it, because because you know, if things are different, they're different, All right? So you end up selling uh, Call Genie, right? To yep. sell the business. At this point, you have a pretty incredible career. I think at this point, you're still a young guy, but you can retire. Yes. Uh, but you decide, hey, let me go and start a venture capital firm. <laughs> oh my gosh, why? <laughs> um, the uh, uh, yeah, you're, you you are right, Matana. I, I was in you know I was in a position I was financially able to do literally whatever I wanted. I did hook up with a couple of uh, the folks from some of the founders at Savile that was an invested you know became an investor partner in a an IT firm, but, but we very quickly, um, uh, put together Zy Ventures Fund. So basically, um, kind of a silent partnership that I had in, in an IT, um, procurement and, uh, and staffing company moved into Zy Ventures Fund because they had a lot of sort of, uh, startup, uh, customers as well. So why did, why did I do that? Um, I think, because I, I got to admit, I was, I was a little fatigued at that point. I was in a position where I could do whatever I want. But what I loved is I loved business and I loved, um, I loved tech and I love software. And I also found that I really liked deal making. So a lot of things that I was doing with running those startups and because I was doing a lot of the capital markets raising, I didn't have an advisor or somebody that was, was helping me. I was doing all that on my own. Uh, you know, I, I enjoyed doing deals. So to me, it felt like the best of both worlds. I, I, I didn't want to retire. I didn't want to do anything uh, or just purely consult. What I wanted to do was to kind of stay in the game. And, you know, so uh, the venture fund sort of w- was a great fit because you get to look at a lot of different technologies. You get to, um, you know, be involved in not just one, but many. And yet at the same time, you don't have all the uh, uh, the... I was going to say the headache, but sure, the headache of of a lot of people and all the operational uh, execution that's required. And yet, you know, you're still in the game. You got a lot of variety of things to look at. Um, it can be very lucrative, obviously, if it's done well. And uh, and I again, guess. there's <laughs> right and and there's yeah. a lot of deal making. Uh, so it, it kind of fit what I was looking for at the time. That's great. And we, I, I met you through co investing in a company yes. uh, recently, and I can say you're one of the. I mean. Thank God I deal with a lot of great investors. Um, but you're one of the few, really, that ha- add a tremendous amount of value. You actually get your hands dirty with with helping the company raise money and strategy and all that. So uh, I learned a lot, actually, from our experiences together. Oh, um, I noticed that people that are former operators are a bit harsher on entrepreneurs because they know they, 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 they give them a lot less slack for BS. Like if they don't hit their numbers or something, they're much like, yeah, I don't like that excuse. Or yeah. <laughs> How, what do you bring in from your operating experience to like the board of a startup or to your investment practice? Um, well, I think, I think there's two things. One is what I think is, you know, having that operator's eye, having that opera that, that, you know, um, uh, that that experience, like you know, I've been them. I've mm-hmm. been in their shoes. I've I've been the highs, the lows. I've had the same anxieties. I've had the same, you know, great feelings and challenges and periods of loneliness. You know, or you know, de- depending on what's going on, uh, because you don't have the same kind of support system you have, of course, with with a big company. So I think just the fact that you know, on one hand, you know, having you you have some instant rapport with them because it's the same. Um, they can't bullshit me, but, but I can't, uh, uh, I can't bullshit them either because, you know, they, they, you know, when you're trying to give advice to somebody, in fact, in fact, you, you talked about value add. I, I think that's one of the most important things that can distinguish, um, a, a venture fund. And it's one of the most important things that you can bring to the table, you know, at, you know, because everyone talks about it. Everyone says that I will, oh, we'll help you. And we have lots of things that we can do for you. Um, and I, I think the truth is a lot of people mistake just tying your companies up with, with helping them. You know, a lot of VC help is nothing at all helpful. They're, they're, they're getting updates and they're having regular contact with, with their, their, their founders, but literally they're having the report to them. And then they're whacking them. I feel if personally they make... attacked. <laughs> <laughs> and, they, 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 and then they, they whack. And I would say you're a great example of the way to be. 
because oh, again, you, you, you engage with, with your people. So it's not about, you know, having a challenging conversation like you say, you know, you know, calling bullshit when you, I don't know if you can swear in your podcast, yeah, but I've done it three times. Not monetize anyways, YouTube. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> all you want. so, you know, it's, um, it, it's not about having tough conversations, it's about having real conversations. And I think the time is over for trite advice, you know, from VCs that, you know, have heard a problem and after one minute think that they, they know the answer. Or you talk about a VC that, yeah, maybe they have even that operations experience and they had a massive win and made a ton of money, which is very often the case, but they did it once. And so now you're a hammer and everything looks like a nail. Mm -hmm. So the, the key is get contextual. You know, create an environment where you can have genuine and authentic conversations with with your 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 portfolio companies, so that it's it's all real. Um, and it may be good conversations, it may be encouragement, it may be you know challenging conversations when when you're challenging them to look at things. But whatever they are, they're real and authentic. And I think you know entrepreneurs see that versus you know I'll do this, I did this, and this is the way that it works, and they've taken no time to understand the problem. Mm -hmm. So the key is real value add comes from getting very contextual, from rolling up your sleeves, from taking the time to understand the the, the problem. Because I, I don't think there are so many easy answers these days. Like the every situation is different. Mm -hmm. For me, once they don't hit their targets, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. Um, so you've had some that hit their targets, <laughs> yeah, right? That's a once in a while. Um, what is your criteria for investing? So obviously just the general, like, is it B2B software? Is it something else? And then what are you looking for in terms of team, market, all that stuff? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think because, you know, as I ventures fund, I, th I think we are a little different than the typical VC. Um, you know, there, there's kind of four things that, um, you know, that, that we look for. I mean, in fact, I'm going to say the word contextual probably another 10 times, but if, if, if I don't, then I'm, I'm, uh, it's, I'm not doing my job here because, you know, the typical VC, um, we used to be typical, but I still think it's the case, um, today in a lot of VCs, you know, they're spending a lot of money, uh, uh, and spraying a lot of money across a research hypothesis. So they figure out what to invest in. They're very smart about that. They're getting a lot of great analysis and then they're investing in that, but they got a lot of money and it's about velocity of deals across a research hypothesis. So we, we don't, you know, we're, we're more of a boutique fund focused at early stage tech and, um, we don't have that kind of money to do a lot of research, but even so, I don't think that works as well. Uh, today, because I think the, the the markets are so dynamic, they're so changing, you know, and it, it's why I think VCs, you know, they, they get a lot of, they scoop up a lot of bad deals that tick off all the boxes and fit that research hypothesis because they haven't gone the extra step to get really contextual. Mm -hmm. So there's, um, so we're trying to flip the whole Pareto instead of having one or two wins out of, you know, uh, 10 that pay all the bills and make a lot of money for people. We want to flip it. We want them all to win. You know, we... So as such, we'll spend a lot more time on an early stage investment, you know, to, to make a $250,000 investment than I think a lot of VCs might to spend, you know, 10 times that because our, our multiple is the velocity of winners. So we're over-engineering our investments because it looks like straight arbitrage to us. So you've got um, great early stage investments and it's all about risk reward. And the Canadian marketplace says that it's, uh, um, you know, early stage tech is very scary. It's statistically scary. Oh, yeah. But if you have an operator's eye and, and background, I, I believe you can, you know, sort through the wheat and the chaff and, and find. And what you'll find is that 90% of them probably don't have a very good opportunity to bless them all. I want them all to win, but 90% probably aren't going to. And they probably never were. And then you can focus at the 10% and then cherry pick the best ones of those. So you can get the top 1%. And at that point, if you have an operator background, and I'm going to cycle back to the question on what's our criteria, and you apply the, uh, the, the right kind of criteria, you can get to the point where you know they can win. Whether they do or not is operational excellence. But if you can get to the point where you know they can succeed, then you've reduced your, your, your risk uh, actually down to just, you know, uh, operational risk. And we further hedge that by being engaged. 
So we're very contextual, we're very iterative, and, and we're an engaged investor. And the criteria we use are we're looking for emerging demand. Um, so we're not going to invest in anything so innovative that you don't know whether that the, there's demand, but mm-hmm. not that those things don't pay off. That's just not us, and that seems pretty risky. So if you're dealing with emerging demand, you see this theme, you know, you're swimming with the tide. That's, uh, that, that's very helpful. You know that there's a market out there, and you can actually research and quantify it. And, and that helps with the second thing, which is product market fit. We're, we're good at that. We're really good at product market fit because of our backgrounds. So if you know there's emerging demand and, you, and there is um, good fit with the solution, like you have to know that that demand has the problem that you think you're trying to solve. So those two things alone are kind of magical. Merging demand and the right product market fit for that demand. Um, you know, the trick is to be able to assess that properly and you need you know, some experience to do that and background and new product introduction and, you know, in, in, uh, in the startup and, and enterprise world. Um, mm-hmm. And then the, um, the other thing is we're, we're looking for, you know, a, a sound business model. And many years ago, there, do, you, do you remember the, uh, oh, it's too early for a business model <laughs> that you heard in Silicon Valley? You know, we're, we're um, you know, we're looking for, you know, it could be gold. Oops, sorry about that. We're looking for, you know, there could be gold there. But you have to be able to exploit. They have to be able to get to it. And you have to be able to be efficiently be able to mine it because if it costs you $1,000 to, to get 500 So we're, we're really uh, especially focused on real business models. And the fourth one, which is frankly the hardest, is, um, you know, the, the, the founder. We're looking for founders who come from the industry and have that insight. Um, you know, we tend not to invest in, in specialty areas but still, we have certain backgrounds that span a lot of different kinds of businesses, a lot in communications, though. But, um, you know, the founder has to have that insight um, because they need that esoteric knowledge to understand, you know, what's, what's going to work and mm-hmm. why this product feature or what they build out next and how they prioritize. So there's a final kind of question here. The latest stats I saw is that pre-seed, pre-seed investment, investments in Canada is almost zero. There's almost no VCs doing pre-seed investments and seed is also pretty small. Uh, and that's not just because of the environment, but it has gotten worse because of interest rates and the weak economy and VCs aren't raising as much money. What would be your advice to entrepreneurs, startups that are struggling right now, either to raise money, build their business, mental health, whatever, like what, what will be your, your advice now to entrepreneurs that are struggling? Um, geez, that's a, a great last question. The, um, I mean, it is tough. It's a, it's a tough environment. And I think, you know, there's, there's some takeaways from some of the stuff that I've already said, which is look at the macro factors, look at market timing. And, um, you know, if the time isn't right now, you know, manage accordingly. Um, you can make some decisions that, that give you longer runway to try and time better times in the, in the market, for example. So I, I'd say, uh, you know, because typically with entrepreneurs, they're starting out here and they're very quickly zooming down into, okay, I'm going to deliver the product. And then they've got their heads down for quite a while and you've got to be able to lift your, your heads up. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, so even, even somebody as flexible and wily as, as your average, you know, startup entrepreneur can get tunnel vision. So I think, um, you know, uh, being patient with, with the market factors uh, is one of them. Uh, the other thing I would say is, you know, um, the founders and startups and, and investors, they, they don't really speak the same language. And I think I can say that because I've been on both sides of, the, of, of that equation. So they, they, they kind of think and they, 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 they do talk a different language. So I think it's really important to try and understand the language that the investor is, is speaking or find a good advisor that can help you understand that language. Um, because, you know, there's, you know, I don't know how many times I've, you know, talked with, um, you know, startups who are, geez, if these dumb investors could just get it <laughs> and give me my $5 million, I would be able to do this thing. They don't understand. They don't know how great this can be. And and by the way, that cuts both ways. I, I would argue that both sides, both communities don't really understand each other as as much as they, they could. Um, so I think to the extent that they, you know, can kind of identify and gain rapport and understand how the capital markets work, you know, then maybe you know, even they can swim against the, the, the tide here and, and find an investment. And, uh, you know, the, everyone, everyone, people watch too much Dragon's Den, right? <laughs> um, 
um, you know, the, the investor needs the, the startup just as much as the startup needs the investor, although there, there, there may be less money chasing those opportunities. But, you know, it's really fit. So if you can really understand that investor and you can understand what it is they're looking for, then you can spend less time with the ones that there aren't a fit and you can um, actually position yourself and probably hopefully get a deal from the ones that, uh, that are a fit. That's great. Thank you, Michael. Uh, we're going to leave more information about Michael and his iVentures in the comments. So check it below if you're interested in learning more. Thank you so much for joining me. That was very helpful. I learned a lot and right. it's great to learn more about your story. Thank you so much for having me, Dan. Always good to see you.